what a pleasure and honor it is for me to be here with you today um, to talk about a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart, the spiritual care of our patients and of each other, uh, religious literacy for healthcare providers. Um, I don't have any relevant financial disclosures, but I will mention the proceeds of which are donated to charity. Um, first, I'll give a brief overview of the topic, and then we'll talk about a few notions of religious literacy, and I'll focus in particular on one um, that is um, endorsed by the American Academy of Religion. It's one that I um, think is probably the best one. And I'll give you five tenets of that notion of religious literacy. And then we'll talk about spirituality and how it's different from religion. And then by way of some research directions, um, I'd like to highlight some points that I think may be personally and professionally relevant for, for all of us. And then I'll end with some, some resources. Um, so just last year, this paper by Tracy Balboni and colleagues came out in JAMA. And it's one that I would recommend reading. It reminds us of the multicultural, spiritual, and religious aspects that are inherent in the care of our patients. Uh, indeed, this paper is thought by several experts in the field to likely be one of the most important in the last 20 years or so at the intersection of healthcare with religion and spirituality. It reviews evidence that we clinicians must proactively incorporate spiritual care into our practice. And this is care which is person-centered and value sensitive. Because we know from good survey data that patients want and need spiritual care. But we also know that we clinicians, maybe perhaps, especially we surgeons, are not by and large um, comfortable enough with our own multicultural, spiritual, religious literacy to do this comfortably with patients. Um, it has been my observation, and perhaps some of you have also noticed, that while much progress has been made um, in recent decades regarding multicultural literacy, less has been made regarding spiritual literacy, and even less, I think, regarding religious literacy. Religion is, after all, along with politics, something that you just don't talk about at Thanksgiving table, for example. So that's all well and good at Thanksgiving, but that same reticence unfortunately spills over into our work lives. It can be uncomfortable to talk about religion if your religious literacy is lacking, especially. We've all been there. I most certainly have been. So to help remedy this situation, I've been doing two main things. One is planning this study, uh, the MedRelit study, or measuring religious literacy among healthcare providers as part of my master's in religion, looking at religious literacy among healthcare providers. And the other is the publication of this uh, book of mine, which was just released this past November. Um, both of these arose out of coursework done um, during my master's, um, which actually just finished this year. Um, the book itself is a collection of nonfiction poetry and prose for all ages. It's about religious literacy and about religion, peace, and conflict in our world. One particularly horrible example of which is, of course, now flaring up in Israel and Gaza. Um, each poem in the book is followed by a learn more section. Uh, the themes are multiculturalism, spiritual and religious literacy, especially insofar as religious literacy is required for spiritual literacy. And as we shall see, for multicultural literacy, since religions are so deeply embedded in every human culture and affect really all members of those cultures, both religious and non-religious members. So moving on to uh, religious literacy, <clears throat> there's th these are a few questions that I think we should ask, which will be very relevant for our time here today. First, what is this thing called religion anyway? Um, what do I mean by religious literacy? Um, and finally, how can you be more religiously literate? And these last two questions are, of course, Largely one and the same because the degree to which we're clear about what we mean by religious literacy um, should correlate with the degree to which we can be more intentional in our daily lives about being more religiously literate. So what is this thing called religion? Well, it, you know, scripture is an important part of a lot of religion, so maybe that's what really defines religion. Um, or maybe it's the rites, rituals, and ceremonies of a particular religion that really defines what that religion is. Or maybe it's really just the beliefs, um, or perhaps the beliefs of a particular faith community that define a religion. Or maybe it just depends on the individual. Um, it is, of course, no single one, but yet all of these. Um, in fact, in, in the book, 
one of the very first poem learn more sections is called what is religion and in fact the whole par part one of the book describes and illustrates with that poem and several others religious literacy the particular kind of religious literacy um, that is endorsed by the american academy of religion and then part two uses that lens of religious literacy to examine several conflicts around the world that have revolved around religion, such as Syria, in Nigeria, Myanmar, um, and of course, Israel, Palestine. Um, there's also a glossary and a reading group guide uh, and a part three that sort of puts it all together, which I'll show you at the end. Uh, this is the that poem, What is Religion? I'm not gonna read this right now, but if there's time later, I'm certainly happy to. Um, and following this poem is a two page spread um, that talks about religion and, and how we define religion. I'll share with you in a moment uh, my definition of religion. Uh, but first, let's talk about religious literacy. So I'm gonna give you five tenets, five key aspects of religious literacy. I'm just gonna list them and then we'll go over them in detail. So number one is distinguishing the inside versus the outside. Number two is recognizing that religions are internally diverse and dynamic. Number three is understanding that religions lack agency. Number four is appreciating religious influences. And finally, number five is recognizing our perspective or our situatedness. So what do I mean by the inside and the outside? Well, by the inside, I mean a prescriptive, devotional or confessional, a theological engagement with religion. This is what many people in this room probably, and certainly people all over the world do on Sundays or Saturdays or Fridays or really any day of the week. It's, it's practicing a religion. Um, it's like being an artist and doing art. You're within the, the realm. Um, by the outside, I mean a descriptive, analytical, or a cultural studies approach to religion. This is what I and countless other religious scholars do all over the world when we study religion and we look at it through a cultural studies approach. This would be like an art historian. And of course, you can be both an artist and an art historian. You can also be a religious person working within religion, engaging with it from inside the religion, and also be um, uh, a scholar of religion looking at it from the outside. Um, but it's important to keep the two separate. Um, and that's the key point here. And the reason I think it's important to keep the two separate is illustrated by an example. So the West Road Baptist Church, as some of you may know, is a hate group in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, these are um, the people you may have seen over the years holding up signs on street corners saying um, God hates fags and all sorts of other horrible nonsense. Um, ISIS is, of course, an Islamic terrorist organization. And when faced with groups like this, um, we often find ourselves asking the question, is the Westboro Baptist Church practicing true Christianity? Is ISIS practicing true Islam? And the point here is that while that is an important question, it's asked from within a religion um, because the answer for that is gonna be no, um, because most of us would reject those interpretations of, of those religions. Um, but the point is that that rejection happens within a religion, you're taking a theological stance, you're taking a, a, a you're, you're making a prescriptive claim um, about the interpretation of that religion. And that's very different than what we do from outside of a religion, when we study a religion from the outside. And the reason it's important to keep those different is if you just say no, you know, even uh, if you think you're asking from the outside, from some sort of objective, neutral position, and you're saying, no, that's not true Christianity, that's not true Islam, then you just write those groups off. And writing them off, I think, is dangerous because it prevents us from then asking important questions. Like, what is it about the West Road Baptist Church and, and our country that allows that to still exist? What is it about ISIS that still attracts so many recruits? Um, so that's why it's important to keep them separate. Um, another important point here is um, illustrated by um, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's The Single Story. Um, because when we just write these groups off, we reduce them to a single story. And if you haven't seen her TED Talk, I'd highly recommend you watch it. It's just a few minutes. You can find it very easily on Google by putting in the single story and her name, Adichie. Um, and the danger uh, that she describes with a single story is that it's incomplete. 
It emphasizes ways that we're different rather than how we're similar, and it makes it easy for cultural violence to occur. Cultural violence um, is the lowest, most fundamental um, uh, level of uh, a common typology of violence that you may have heard about. Um, Johann Galtung, who's widely considered to be the father of peace studies, first coined the term cultural and structural violence. Structural violence often nowadays goes by other terms like um, um, systemic violence. So cultural violence, and there's also peace versions of all of these too. There's also cultural peace and structural peace and direct peace. Um, but cultural violence is the kind of violence that makes the structural violence seem okay, allows it to exist. And of course, direct violence is what the structural violence gives rise to. And that um, is a common thread that runs through the course of the book and through the course of this talk is that topology of violence um, and peace. So, so that's probably the most difficult one to uh, get your head around, um, keeping the inside um, separate from the outside. Um, just recognizing that those are different. Um, number two is simply recognizing that religions are internally diverse and dynamic. So are all Christians, Muslims, Hindus, agnostics, the same as all other people in those religions or faith traditions or worldviews? Well, no, of course they're not. There are rather indeed multiple legitimate interpretations of all of those uh, religions or worldviews because religions are internally and temporally diverse. In other words, they're different within themselves and they're, they change over time. Um, Christianity or Islam is a religion of peace. Uh, it is, is a, a statement that kind of reeks of religious illiteracy because it implies a certain homogeneity that just doesn't really exist. Um, religions aren't like that. Um, number three is understanding that religions lack agency. So here an example may be helpful again. So the phrase Islam hates us um, was unfortunately increasingly heard after 9-11 and especially during the 2016 election. Um, and the reason that this is an example of religious illiteracy is because religions don't hate or love anybody. They don't, in fact, do anything. People do. We do. And in fact, what we do matters. Um, tremendously because neither peace nor violence um, is inevitable. It, it matters a lot on our human agency. Uh, but religions aren't like that. Religions are things that we humans interpret. Um, uh, we have agency, we're actors, we do things um, in and unto the world, uh, but religions aren't like that, uh, people are. Um, and number four is appreciating religious influences because they exist in all parts of public and um, life and culture. This is sometimes obvious, but often it's really not. Um, sometimes it's just really easy to miss what's all around you. It's like the fish, you know, not recognizing the water they're swimming in. It's just, you know, it's a path you walk on. Um, clearly religions are private affairs, but the point here is that they're not merely private. And it's important to remember that. And number five is just recognizing our perspective or situatedness. Because it's really easy to forget that the only place from which we can see, experience, and understand the world and its religions is, you guessed it, precisely where we happen to be. Because we cannot pull off what uh, historian of science Donna Haraway has called the God trick. The God trick is the ability to see everything from nowhere. And we can't do that because we are all, of course, somewhere. Um, so those are five tenets of religious literacy. That notion of religious literacy that I, that I just went over is a very much based in understanding. It's a concept-based notion of religious literacy, but it's not the only one. There are, for example, other notions that are more based in knowledge. For example, um, maybe someone in the audience has heard of Stephen Prothero, who wrote a New York Times best-selling book a few years ago called Religious Literacy, um, What Every American Needs to Know and Doesn't. He makes a lot of really good points in that book. Um, in particular, that if you're going to be a citizen in um, the democracy of the United States, you ought to know something about Protestantism, because historically, the United States has been run by white male straight Protestants. Um, and there really hasn't been until very recently a single Hindu, Jew, Muslim, uh, non-white male straight Protestant in a high office. Um, and the, the problem is when you're in healthcare. 
um, there's a great diversity of, of people that we take care of, like there is in the world. Um, but the diversity in healthcare is different from the diversity in the general population in a couple of important ways. Um, they're probably similar in their degree of diversity, but in the healthcare setting, there's a power differential, right? When you're walking in the grocery store or talking to your neighbor, like you're kind of peers. But when you're when you're a healthcare provider and you're taking care of patients, there's an important power differential because the patient is beholden to the provider um, for their healthcare. And that's a hugely important difference that just doesn't exist in the general population. Um, and also in the general population, people are free to roam about and mingle. Um, they're not so much in healthcare. So the second reason why healthcare diversity is very different from diversity in the general population is that there are social circumstantial constraints. You can't necessarily choose from whom to receive your care if you show up in the ER or in a doctor's office. And of course, a third reason they're very different is, you know, patients who enter the healthcare system are generally at risk. Um, they have an illness or an injury. Um, and we know that patients in, in, who present with illness and injury um, generally have a lower socioeconomic status. And there's all the risks that are accompanying with that. Um, so in the healthcare system, you're going to have a great diversity of patients and there's, there's all these important, um, the stakes are higher because of those three reasons. Um, and you can't possibly know all the facts about every other religion. So that's one of the major reasons I think sort of a fact-based notion of religious literacy like Prothrow has is not as useful in healthcare as this more concept-based notion of religious literacy. So leaving religious literacy for a moment, let's talk about spirituality and how that's different from religion. So religion and spirituality are, of course, related but distinct concepts. Um, I would define religion as um, a construct that is made by people in the context of a culture and a society. It's generally institutionalized in a set of beliefs about the transcendent, which is shared by a community, often but not always involving worship of God or gods, um, and typically stressing a distinction between the sacred and the commonplace. There are many good definitions of religion. I think that's one of them. Um, spirituality, by contrast, is a broader but related concept. It is, of course, traditionally and historically rooted in religion. Um, and it's a dynamic and intrinsic, and that's important too. It's intrinsic. It's part of all humans. All humans, religious or not religious, are, are spiritual. That's a part of being human. It's a dynamic and an intrinsic part of humanity through which we seek ultimate meaning, purpose, and transcendence, and through which we experience relationship to ourselves, to family, others, community, to society, to nature, and to the significant or the sacred. Spirituality is expressed through beliefs, values, traditions, and practices, but those may be religious or they may not be. And there are many reasons why we care about the spiritual health of our patients and our clients, one of which is that it's one of the main domains of the whole person. Um, it is that domain that includes meaning, purpose, dignity, hope, faith, community, connection, and love, forgiveness, gratitude. Um, and this model, the biopsychosocial spiritual model of the whole person, is relatively new, but yet it isn't. What do I mean by that? Well, um, healthcare and medicine are deeply entwined of human existence, um, and they have um, grown up together, each has existed as long as the other in all of human history, which is safe for all of human history. Um, during the Renaissance, however, science and religion grew increasingly in opposition to each other. And accordingly, medicine came to see religion as a barrier to progress um, as it began to leave behind the supernatural in favor of the scientific until medicine and religion had really largely separated from each other. And the separation increased through the Enlightenment, which for all of its beautiful boons, uh, threatened to seal a divorce. Um, indeed, many experts in the field could see that while healthcare was broken and that this idea of the whole person, the biopsychosocial spiritual patient, had become all but lost in the rubble. So doctors during this time were largely focused on treating disease on the biological patient, focused on pathophysiology. 
but in 1948, the World Health Organization redefined health as not merely the absence of disease, but rather a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease. Huge step forward. Um, and subsequent generations of medical students, myself included, began to learn that biopsychosocial model. But a few healthcare providers were now realizing that an entire component of the whole person was still missing, the spiritual aspect. Um, so by the mid-1980s, um, the biopsychosocial model of health and disease was increasingly yielding to the now truly whole model of biopsychosocial spiritual person. Um, and including those recent years of last year, which was the publication of that JAM article that I showed you on one of the first slides about spirituality and serious illness. Um, an increasingly number of, of, of experts in the field and, and of, of clinicians around the world are realizing the importance of putting this back, back in place, this spiritual component. And another reason we care about this, of course, is that research shows that religion and spirituality are associated with good health outcomes, um, improved quality of life, decreased depression and anxiety, better well-being, improved coping, increased adherence and compliance to treatment recommendations, improved social functioning. Um, and by contrast, spiritual distress is associated with worse health outcomes, including greater physical pain, depression and anxiety, worse emotional well-being, diminished quality of life, and even increased risk of suicide, um, a topic we'll come back to towards the end of the talk. Spiritual distress occurs when a patient or anybody um, experiences but can't resolve a loss of dignity, uh, meaningless, a hopelessness or despair, or feeling a loss of control. It's a conflict between deeply held beliefs and values and life events, like an illness or a loss that threatens those deeply held beliefs and values. Uh, this is a criteria for um, Diagnosing spiritual distress, it's essentially a spiritual issue that leads to distress or suffering. Um, and so how do we assess spiritual distress? Well, here are three levels of assessment, um, starting from the most superficial at the top down to the deepest. Uh, and we'll start with the deepest, spiritual assessment. This is the most extensive assessment of spiritual distress. This is not done by most of us spiritual generalists in the audience. This is something that is done by a board certified chaplain or another spiritual care professional. Um, the level above that would be a spiritual history taking. This is often done by uh, a general medical care provider. Uh, and then at the top is spiritual screening, which everybody who interacts with patients should know how to do. Any clinical care provider, including the person doing intake screenings, um, should know how to screen for spiritual distress. And it's super easy to do. It's simply a quick determination of whether a person is experiencing spiritual distress. Um, there are several good tools for doing this. Um, the top one is a simple four word, single item assessment tool is well validated and simply asks, are you at peace? Um, you can also ask, are you having spiritual pain, which is a pain deep in your soul that's not a physical pain. And there's a, in, a spiritual injury scale. Um, here's an example of a remarkably easy screen for spiritual distress that I think would be appropriate for most any clinician to do. Um, this is, in fact, what I do in my office with all my patients. Um, and the key here is, of course, asking these questions in an interactive way, not like a machine where they're just checking boxes. Um, I have patients fill this out in the, off in the office when they're waiting, and then I go over it with them face to face. I first ask them if they're religious, spiritual, both or neither. That's going to tend to direct where you go after that. And then I use that, that simple um, or, or in this typo situation, three word question, are you at peace? And then I ask them, are you struggling with loss of meaning, enjoying your life, or are you um, currently having what you would describe as religious or spiritual struggles? And for people who answer um, worrisomely for these questions, I just make a referral to our um, outpatient chaplains who are very happy to speak with these patients as an outpatient. Um, um, 
the next level of inquiry is going to be taking a spiritual history. Here are three common ways to do that. You may have heard of some of these. FICA uh, was identified, was developed by uh, Christina Polchowski, who runs the George Washington Institute for Spirituality and Health um, in D.C. Um, there's also Spirit is Hope. Um, these are easy to find online and very easy to use uh, once you look them up. So I'll let you do that on your own. I, I particularly like to use FICA. Um, so just to sum up this portion, so there's some recommendations that I would take home with this is that every patient should be screened for spiritual distress. It literally just takes a question. Um, this screening may be performed by any care provider, even the staff who's screening patients. Um, all clinicians should include uh, um, spiritual, uh, should, all clinicians should consider themselves spiritual generalists um, and use an appropriate uh, tool. Of course, it should be documented. And the last one is that um, chaplains and other spiritual uh, specialists should be an integral part of your healthcare team. Um, so, so those are summing up where we've come so far. So those are five main tenets of religious literacy and a very brief primer on spiritual care. The point I now wanna make is that spirituality is not the same as religious literacy. Just like being spiritual is not necessarily the same thing as being religious. Um, so also being spiritually literate is not necessarily the same thing as being religiously literate. Um, as Chan and Sitek put it, just because someone is a religious professional doesn't mean that they're religiously literate. Um, and indeed, as Kleins and Gilead Ray acknowledge in their chapter, Religious Literacy and Chaplaincy, in a book called Religious Literacy and Policy and Practice, even chaplaincy can, by default, operate without being religiously literate. This is coming from chaplains writing a book about chaplaincy. Um, so I want to stress that we clinicians should all be spiritual generalists. We should be collaborating with spiritual specialists, for example, our chaplains. There's a tendency to see spiritual religious issues, at least for those of us who are clinicians, that's just not my wheelhouse. That's someone else's job. Uh, and this is normal because we're more comfortable working within our specialty. Um, in my experience, many or all chaplains I know pride themselves on not proselytizing and do an excellent job of avoiding that error trap. And we should all follow that model. But the other side of that coin can be not engaging as well with persons of other faith traditions. Um, because when the clinician and the, um, and the, the person ministered to, the patient in this case, um, come from religious traditions that are concordant, connection making is easy. But when they come from different religious traditions, there's a potential for that connection to falter, often due, I think, in part to religious a lack of religious literacy. And this general lack of religious literacy in healthcare is what has guided my research on measuring religious literacy among healthcare providers. And the focus here is on healthcare providers because, as we mentioned before, clinicians generally aren't very comfortable with religious literacy, like the general population. Why is that? Well, there are several barriers to um, religious literacy. Um, a, a survey of several hundred oncology clinicians found that 74% of nurses and 60% of physicians wanted to provide spiritual care when caring for their patients. Um, and most frequently endorsed barriers to this included a lack of time and a lack of privacy but also a lack of training and the thought that spiritual care is better offered by others. And I group them like that, even though they're not listed like that, because I think the thought that the spiritual care is better offered by someone else, that it's not my wheelhouse, is a manifestation of inadequate training. And indeed, inadequate training was identified as the strongest predictor of spiritual care provision to patients. If we look more deeply into this literature, we'll see that one of the major barriers is indeed a lack of religious literacy, an observation that prompted me after all to write that book. Um, surveyed residents thought that they should discuss religion and spirituality, but said that a lack of training was an obstacle. Uh, Dinham, who's one of the world experts in religious literacy in the UK, has observed that the relationship between religion and spirituality and healthcare has been poorly addressed because professionals lack religious literacy and are largely, therefore, unable to engage well with religion and spirituality. And Chan and Sitek, again, have 
made the observation that the belief among healthcare providers that they need more religious literacy training is common. However, one of the most fundamental unresolved issues in this area is that religious literacy, however important it may be to patients at the intersection of medicine and religion, is hard to study because there's no widely used instrument available to measure religious literacy. Um, unlike religion and spirituality, for which there are many good instruments available, there's no universally agreed upon definition of religious literacy. There are um, after all, as I mentioned before, several other notions of religious literacy. The one I described is very concept-based, which I think is, for the reason we talked about before, is best applied to medicine compared with a more fact-based notion of religious literacy. And there are others. So therefore, um, you know, my, my current and in-progress research goals are to um, perform a critical analysis of the conceptions of religious literacy as applied to healthcare. This is basically the topic of my master's thesis, which actually just finished. Um, and then to design and validate a quantitative instrument to measure this concept-based religious literacy um, as um, defined by the American Academy of Religion. This is one way that you do that. Uh, for those of you who are interested, it's a nine step, three phase process that takes a long time and involves a lot of people and a lot of statistics. Um, um, so after those first two steps, the next step would be to use this uh, new med relit instrument to address this relatively unexplored issue of whether the level of religious literacy among healthcare providers working with patients typically patients who are facing a life-threatening diagnosis or an operation can be increased by a short-term intervention. And if it can be to learn, maybe even more, most importantly, what are the possible effects on patients regarding, for example, their overall experience and um, their experience of their own religion and spirituality. Uh, and similarly, and I think importantly, um, possible effects of increasing religious literacy on provider experience and well-being could easily um, be investigated. Having a diagnosis of cancer, especially a new diagnosis of cancer, or facing a potentially life-threatening operation, which essentially are our, our, our patients after all, right? Um, it's difficult enough for patients. Um, but this was all made much worse, of course, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, indeed, healthcare workers um, also suffered increased burnout during the pandemic. Um, burnout was particularly fierce during these past few years, during which the sur during the surges of this pandemic, in the words of this study from um, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, exhaustion and moral distress became nearly universal among healthcare workers. And even prior to the pandemic, burnout was high among um, healthcare workers. In this systematic review published the year before the pandemic, um, prevalence estimates for the overall burnout and burnout subtypes among physicians were 67% for overall burnout, 72% for emotional exhaustion, and 68% for depersonalization. And sadly, but really not um, surprisingly, healthcare worker burnout is associated with poorer quality care. In this systematic review and meta analysis of the literature, Tofik and colleagues examined 123 publications, including over 240,000 healthcare providers, to examine the relationship between quality of care and burnout. They studied five quality of care outcomes, one of which was quality and safety. Among the 74 quality and safety studies, burnout was significantly associated, inversely proportional to the quality of healthcare, underscoring the important relevance of provider burnout to the current issue. And burnout can be life threatening. The risk of suicide was found in this review to be five to seven times higher for physicians than for the general population. And surgeons, who comprise one of the main provider groups, for work like this, since having an operation is a, a major stressor in a patient's life, are in one of the highest risk specialties. Yet, the stresses that derive from the doctor-patient relationship are stressful precisely because that relationship is so special. 
for all healthcare providers, but especially perhaps, I think, for you surgeons who literally and figuratively touch patients more intimately than many or maybe all of their specialties. All clinicians are uniquely poised to leverage this intimacy in the service of patients. As surgeon writer Richard Seltzer has poetically put it, the flesh is the spirit thickened. And you all do well to remember that, we all will. The practice of medicine, and particularly the practice that is surgery, due to its ability to present patients with a crisis situation, confers on the clinician a very special role. That stance of the healthcare provider to the patient has not been compared to that of a priest for not by so many writers, including by Richard Seltzer again in this other book of his. Because the magnitude of meaning that develops can be similarly great. So because that sometimes stressful relationship is so powerful, it may ironically therefore be particularly suited to addressing the spiritual needs that not only of the patient, but also of the provider. As Judith Petri has pointed out in her very apropos titled article, Surgery and Meaning, by approaching surgery as a potential catalyst for healing and helping patients to explore the meaning of their surgery in their lives, we can heal the patient and the specialty. And I think this applies to all clinicians that this meaning is so important, so much more than happiness. It is meaning that is most essential to us humans. Emily Eschavahani Smith, an award-winning and best-selling author who grew up in a Sufi household in Montreal, describes four pillars of meaning in this book of hers, The Power of Meaning. Echoing the observations of physician and Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl 70 years either, earlier, who popularized the idea in this book that in light of the unavoidability of suffering, our human problem is not so much suffering per se, since we all do and will suffer, but rather suffering without meaning. Importantly for today's discussion, the, also the idea that one's religiosity and spirituality is a major part of what provides that essential meaning. Meaning which is so badly needed to accompany the inevitable suffering that accompanies illness and injury that brings people to engage with our healthcare system. And here, by the way, uh, is Emily Esfahani Smith's TED Talk. It comes in both a three and a 12 minute version, uh, easy to find uh, on Google and highly would recommend looking at it. She goes over her four pillars of, um, of meaning. So my main point here is that it's not only patients who stand to benefit from increased religious literacy in healthcare. Burnout, of physicians and other healthcare providers is an increasing problem. And when presented with a charge to do one more thing that we don't have time to do, such as provide the spiritual care that this landmark 2022 paper by Balboni calls for, namely spiritual care that's facilitated and increased by religious literacy, those providers, we providers, may well reply that we're simply too busy to be able to afford to spend that time. However, I would suggest to you that mounting evidence and experience about the benefits accrued by providers who do tend to spend, who do tend to spiritual care, um, suggest that those tables should actually turn. It is not that providers cannot afford to spend the time, but rather they can not afford not to, given the ability of tending to spiritual care undergirded by religious literacy to improve provider well-being and decrease burnout. Before all that can happen, however, physicians need to become religiously literate. Um, just to recap, I'd like to give you the, this is that part three of the book that recaps religious literacy. On the left side, there are ways that we all are often religiously illiterate. Um, and on the right side, there are those same five ways how to be religiously literate and with examples and page numbers that refer to the poems and learn more section. So finally, I'd like to just end by giving you a few resources. Um, 
this first one is uh, GWISH's ISPET course. I mentioned this earlier. GWISH is a George Washington Institute for Spirituality and Healthcare. Uh, and ISPECT is the Interprofessional Spiritual Care Education Curriculum. It's a two day, all day course designed for clinician chaplain pairs um, to learn about spiritual care and then return to their institutions and share it with everyone, much like I'm doing with you now. And ideally to enact um, real on the ground changes at those institutions. Not everyone can take two days out of their work to go to a course, however, Brandeis University is the home of the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab, and they have a spiritual general course, a spiritual generalist course that is um, asynchronous um, and very amenable to any hospital, such as ours, for example, sending a cohort of nurses or, or uh, other clinicians. And then, of course, there's my book on religious literacy, which I, of course, would recommend. Uh, Dr. Polchowski, who founded and runs GWISH, very generously called it an absolute must read for clinicians and educators. Um, and so with that, I'll stop. And uh, I think I've left enough time for questions. We have maybe about eight minutes for questions. And so I thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions. I have, I have one question. You said you do the uh, spiritual screening in your office. Have you found by and large people are pretty much okay? Or do you find most of them are not okay? Uh, oh, everyone, no, everyone, everyone answers those questions. Um, nobody has ever complained about them. Oh, I meant, I didn't mean like being okay. I just meant like, are, are uh, oh, oh, are people, oh, I see. Have a lot of problems oh, I see. Yeah, no, right. Not are they okay with, Answering the questions, like the questions reveal that they're okay as, as spiritually. Um, you know, uh, whoever is not muted, maybe you could just mute. Thanks. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of the patients I see have just received uh, a new diagnosis of cancer, um, and and most of them coming to see a surgeon are facing, on some level, the prospect of needing an, an operation, which I think for any normal human is a life threatening situation. You know, one of the most um, powerful images, I think I it was when actually it was Adrian Park, who's um, was the head of general surgery at the time. Um, he, he he drew a line on the board all the way across the board. He said, "This is your life." And then you know here you're born, um, here um, you start school, maybe you graduate, you get a job, you get married, you retire, you die. Like, there are these majors, and somewhere in the middle there you have an operation. Maybe all of those are major life events for every human. Like they're not things that you forget. They're not your day, your everyday life. Those are major life events, life altering events, including having the operation. And then he drew lines up and down this way um, to illustrate that, you know, for us surgeons, every one of those major life events for another human is just another day in our work. And it's really easy to forget that because for us, it's just an every, it's just another day. But so to answer your question, for all these people who are coming to me in the office, this is that life event. I'm going to see a surgeon. I might need an operation. So yeah, I I, I would say the 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 rate of of spiritual distress in my practice, especially with, with people who are, you know, maybe not the ones who are coming for their third visit of uh, stable cyst, but people who you know are, think they may be you know needing an operation or have a life ending problem. Yeah, there's a high rate in my practice of spiritual distress. Yeah, Dr. Dunley. Can I, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so what percent of people are say the religious versus spiritual versus gold versus neither? Have you noticed in your verses? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, you know, I, I haven't, um, I haven't gone back and sort of looked at the ratio, but it kind of just, a, kind of a gestalt, kind of a gut feeling. Um, it kind of feels to me across the board. Um, and, and sometimes it changes within one patient. Uh, for example, I had a guy um, a, a couple months ago who said, you know, neither. And then he, you know, he had his operation, did fine, came back for his post-op visit. We we're like, okay, doing great. Goodbye. He had, a, you know, it was one of those hands on the doorknob moments. <laughs> He's like, you know, remember that question you asked me? It was actually both. <laughs> So he wanted to talk about it all then, um, so which is fine. I mean, the, but I like that story because it illustrates how you just you have to meet people where they are. 
um, including your colleagues and the people you work with, but especially patients, because they're all in a different place. And, you know, it's easy to just go through our day, you know, especially on, on rounds as a busy resident, for example, with your, you know, especially on a surgical oncology service where you have, you know, patients who, you know, just got a diagnosis of uh, curable cancer that was removed yesterday. The next one had an unremovable pancreas cancer, uh, you know, so th these people are in very different places and it's very easy for you to just go through rounds um, on a very superficial level. But it, if you take a minute and sit on the bed and meet people where they are, like you're gonna make these connections that really matter. So, you know, the answer to your question, I think it's, they're kind of all over the board and even individual patients go back and forth. W one question in the back, but I think Dr. Jaberi on, online had a question also. Yes, thank you. So, um, as you know, I, I see breast cancer all, all day, uh, all day, every day, and it seems like um, that that um, you know, not only taking care of those patients is 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 pretty um, emotional at times, but it also um, is really taxing on the on the person, which is me. Um, I wanted to share a story, and that is that um, a lot of times patients come to me and they, um, one of the, you know, after you've discussed all this stuff and you're ready to wrap up everything, they ask about my religion. They ask about what do I believe in? And um, I have a sort of a prepared answer of inclusivity, and that is um, I tell them that I was born to Muslim parents. And um, so they want that. They want to know what's my religion and what's my state of mind and what's my relationship with God. And it was at uh, first, you know, the first time I got this question years ago, I was like, wow, you know, it's kind of intrusive, but, you know, this person's in pain. So let me just answer them. So I told them, like, I was born to Muslim parents. Um, uh, you know, my parents are Iranian, but I was born here in the United States. I grew up here. And my parents wanted me to have a faith based learning, and they put me in Catholic school for many years <laughs> um that's uh that means from beginning of middle school to the end of high school and when i uh, when i came out of catholic school you know i was i was i had two religions married in my mind and so um when i went to hopkins i t uh, people were always asking me if miriam's a biblical name and we had a very large jewish population i had a great number of jewish friends and i got introduced to that religion and then I married their concepts into my head. And then all of a sudden, next thing I know, I am like um, believing in all three religions at once. And so when people were asking me this religion concept, I started saying I'm very spiritual because you can't say you're all three. And that's that, you know, they, they would be offended. Um, and so to this day, uh, if someone asked me that religion, I, 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 I explained that background. Literally, I say those words, that's my prepared statement. And it puts them at ease because it covers pretty much um, a lot of, you know, a lot of our faiths. You know, I think in, in the future, I really want to learn more about Buddhism and, and, um, and the Hindu religion and just keep going with that and maybe tell them that I've taken a course in spirituality with them. Because I think the times where I'm spiritual, the times when I, I have time to spend with God, I have a weekend where I can meditate. I have a weekend where I can go to church. Um, and the reason I go to church is because, you know, as a when you grow up with the church, you kind of feel like, where's the place you feel more comfortable with? That's the place I feel comfortable in. Um, it seems that I do better. As a doctor, I do better. And and then I'm a better surgeon too. So I just wanted to share that with you. Yeah, thank you very much, Miriam. That's that's a really interesting story. It illustrates a lot of a lot of interesting points about about you know how one size doesn't really fit all. Um, and it's just really important to mention that. I mean, religions, as we said, are internally diverse, and we all interpret them in, in different ways. Um, yes, sir. When you are seeing patients, do you see generationally diverse difference in how you screen? And what kind of led you to using the FICA screening to over so many other? Yeah, I think so. The, the question, in case people online couldn't hear it, was um, Have I noticed that, you know, piggybacking on the previous question from Dr. Domley, have I noticed a generational difference? Um, and uh, why do I like the FICA tool? Um, um, 
Yeah, I think, you know, um, generations are very different from each other, including in many ways, including this way. Um, I, my kind of gut instinct is that uh, younger generations um, find their spirituality in different places than older generations. But I think they're just as spiritual. Um, and they can be things that you wouldn't ordinarily think of as spiritual religious. Um, actually, Wendy uh, Kaj gives uh, gave a great talk at the Chautauqua Institute um, just a few months ago about chaplaincy and, and how the whole landscape is changing. Um, and that we have to adapt to that landscape because the venues used to be churches and mosques and synagogues where people's spirituality found a home. But for a lot of people nowadays who self-identify as nuns, N-O-N-E-S, um, you know, with no particular religious affiliation, these are people who are human and are still spiritual, but the, the venue has changed. You know, it may be something as odd as a Harry Potter uh, book group was one example she used in this Chautauqua, um, yeah, and she had been. Um, so yeah, so I, I think there's a big general generational difference, and um, th that's the, the the aspect about the difference that strikes me most. I think, um, and I, I like FICA because it's easy to remember, it's easy to use. It's the first one I learned, um, and you know I haven't really sort of done a head-to-head -head comparison with any of the other very good tools that are out there. Yes, Ali. Yeah. So. Um... So actually, uh, the question about Dr. Javari or the current that she was uh, <laughs> maybe that's this question. So when I ask, uh, when I ask this question about a patient, I try to be honest and saying, you know, I'm not religious, maybe barely a spiritual, depends on the day, maybe agnostic, maybe us. This is what I am. But the thing is, do you think in a patient that when we read the room and we see that they are religious and spiritual, my answer should be more politically and spiritually correct try to make the report more stronger with them on the cost of honesty and i pretend to be more spiritual with them or no i should just be honest and say do you know i don't believe in anything uh, maybe very spiritual yeah that's a really really good question and it's a difficult question i mean this there there are you know whole conference sections and whole journal articles that are dedicated to this question of, about you know how should you as a as a clinician respond if somebody asks you for example to pray with them i mean it's it, it's a hard situation and it's like anything else it's sort of best taken on a case-by-case -case basis and the more religiously literate you are the easier you're going to navigate that situation certainly and also the better the rapport you have with patients and and the better you're going to navigate it and also the more comfortable you are in your own skin the better you're going to navigate that situation so so yeah you could be you know um pretty strictly agnostic or atheist, um, maybe with um, a childhood in, you know, Judaism or Catholicism um, that's not really that important to you anymore. And if a patient is coming to you, say, a, you know, a Jewish or Catholic patient and, and asking you to pray with them and you have a good rapport with them and someone you know well and you feel comfortable doing that, um, that probably wouldn't be the time to emphasize your atheism, right? Like, because, you know, there, there are many levels of, of truth and honesty, and, and, and you, you can still meet the patient where the patient is and be true to yourself, um, because we humans are like that. Like, there, there, there's subtlety. Um, and so, you know, those nuances are the way that you navigate those situations, I think. So actually, the, the, the more people are attuned, I think, to nuance and, and subtlety, I think the better communicators they are in general. I mean, people, you know, we all know people, some of us have those traits ourselves, you know, where we miss nuances and, and subtlety in conversations and all sorts of mishaps, you know, sometimes funny, sometimes tragic happen in those situations. So, can you refuse as a health care provider, like a patient is asking you to pray with them like for example, I'm a Christian, and uh, like a satanic person wants me to pray with them. <laughs> like, you know, like that's completely. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, so you know, we're. <laughs> so just for the people online who maybe couldn't hear, you know, this uh, the last two questions were about you know how do you navigate these situations when someone asks to pray with you, um, and you know what if you're 
what if you're um, very opposed to um, the to, to, to the belief, or you know, you know, what if it's a, a, a um, what if what if the proposal um, strikes you as offensive or abhorrent in some way? You know, of, of course you're not obligated to pray with them, but you know, there's there's a there's I, I would just I would like to think, and indeed I do think, and and would suggest to you that in every situation you're going to encounter the patient, like there's a there's a good way to navigate that. And if you get someone who's like, you know, pull on your chain and like, oh, I heard your religious. I'm a Satanist. You want you know, like, and to use your kind of ridiculous example, you know, would you do a seance with me? I mean, you know. Then now you're just kind of getting in all sorts of ridiculous situations that you just got to navigate like you would any other, you know, difficult patient situation. But no, you, you certainly are not obvious. You have to do something that you're comfortable with, um, that's true to yourself, and that honors honors the patient. Probably in the reverse order. <laughs> yes. Um, I think this kind of a situation reminds us to sometimes is when our plan of treatment can conflict with the patient's religious belief. Um, so basically, it's, it ends up being one or the other. So is this a situation? Would this be a situation where we probably have shop lane and the surgeon to do a treatment or is it yeah, so um, for in case people online couldn't hear it, the question is, you know, what what do you do when um, the religion, um, if I could rephrase your question, kind of gets in the way of medical care? Um, I guess, you know, a very common example would be a Jehovah's Witness who declines what everyone else thinks is a necessary blood transfusion. Um, um, and, and by the way, I can't see everyone online. So if someone online has a question, maybe just shout out after this question. Um, if your hands raised, I, I may not see it. Um, so that's a great question. And there, you know, and I don't have a great answer. I mean, there, there are nobody in this room will be surprised to hear countless examples of um, religion and medicine colliding in that way. Um, we had a patient actually in this hospital uh, um, who was a Jehovah's Witness in our ICU was a mother of a young child who died because of blood loss anemia. Um, and those are super hard questions. And, and, and I would wholeheartedly agree with your answer to your own question that you're spot on. Those are situations that you don't navigate by yourself. Um, this is why we have inpatient chaplains. I mean, the threshold for involving for you as a spiritual generalist, for involving a spiritual specialist should be really low, I think. And I um, don't think I would be inappropriately speaking for our chaplains if I say that they would be very happy to help in those situations. We are. <laughs> Endorsement from the chaplains in the back. Yes. Um, of a patient that comes in because um, I tend to get some of those calls from this team um, in regards to the assessment. I just think that in seeing the, uh, the form that they fill out and the answers that they give may be helpful to us when we have to reach out to them to uh, talk with them in regards to uh, how they're feeling about certain things so that we can kind of navigate a little targeting the areas in which maybe they may, they may be having uh, struggles in. So I think that would be possibly helpful for us if that can be. Um, we do get calls to see maybe what area that might be in when we do give them a call. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I mean, it's like... We don't get to see that part. Of it. We just get the name. I just get the name yes. of the patient. Right. But, I mean, um, when I saw that, it was like that would kind of help kind of target conversation. This is the question that I think many people in this, uh, or a comment that many people in this audience can relate to because it's like ordering a, a, a test and not telling the radiologist what you're looking for, right? I, you know, I mean, there's a, there are literally countless things to look for in the CT scan. You got to tell the radiologist what you're interested in. And it's the same thing with a consult to um, chaplaincy. I mean, some background is, is, is necessary. 
conversation. If I if I may speak. Depending upon what you want to talk about, but, um, you don't need to, you don't have to let out of your program. Okay. And question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I do happen to see a, a hand raised, um, Stan. Is, there, is your hand up uh, intentionally, or have you already asked a question? And Mary, your hand no, is still up. I, I do have a question or a statement, anyway. Oh, I am a chaplain, and um, I'm going to use an analogy, if I may, from uh, the work of Nakajima, who was a furniture designer and very famous for that. Uh, as you know, when people lumber for furniture, they tend to use rectangles, very straight lines. And uh, they say, oh, OK, I'm going to make a table. And since I'm making this table, I have to make the wood in this shape. So Nakashima, what he would do is he would look at the beautiful designs in the wood. The designs were already there. And he would lump around, he would lumber around the beautiful picture of the inner life of the wood. So he wouldn't cut through a gorgeous design in order to make a table. He would lumber around the beautiful design and then he would decide what type of furniture he would make. So I think the same is true in caring for the human soul. Uh, he called, there's a book of his called The Soul of a Tree. And it gives him work, it's probably available on interlibrary loan, definitely worth seeing. So if I listen to a patient, yes, I'm listening to religion, but I'm also listening to the inner religion. That which is most beautiful, centers of meaning. And I listen to that and speak that, that back to the patient. And I'll say, I see this in you. Given that, what do you think would be the best decision for you to make in this con context of your own inner life, which I'm seeing as you're speaking it to me? Yeah, well, very well said, Chaplain Stan. Uh, it's a great analogy. In fact, it applies to some of the questions that were asked here about how do you navigate those situations? I mean, if you can keep your eye on the patient's um, beautiful spots, their knots, their twists, and and work around those and meet them where they are. That's, I think, the best way to go about it. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're right. I, Can I, I say something? Yes, please. Steve? Yes, Miriam, go ahead. Uh, Steve, um, I just want to Not really hearing you, Miriam. Sorry. religious um, literacy. It's not my for him, but it has a I also love the fact you shared with the College of Surgeons, so that surgeons read your work. That's truly fast. Thanks so much for giving this talk, sharing your knowledge. When you went on that website and provided those APS, so will benefit from this. Okay, yeah. I yeah, so there, there is a resource on the ACS website. You cut out for a little bit, but I think we got the gist of it. Thank you very much for those kind words. Okay, well, we're, we're way over time now. Um, um, I know people have got places to go. I am certainly happy to hang around and talk some more, but I think we'll wrap up here. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your attendance and your kind attention and questions.